morning, everybody. I'm Casey. And I'm Darren. And today we're arguing if there should or shouldn't be limits on genetic manipulation. Um, to stop and be kind of both brief and broad, uh, genetic manipulation is defined at Biology Online as the sort of taking of an organic, an organic thing and changing the way it works to do a specific task or to give it specific traits. This includes, but is also not limited to, uh, cloning, which is a big subject for sci-fi books like myself, uh, genetic selection and identification, and gene therapy. Uh, I'm actually arguing for the yes side, as in yes, there should be limits on genetic manipulation. As I was doing my research, I kind of came across three sort of big arguments. A political argument, which is how do you sort of get this big, ambiguous thing to legislate correctly. Um, biological, so what kind of happens to us as a species when we start manipulating our own gene sequences. And a big and heated argument, which came up again and again, was a humanitarian sort of approach. So how does this impact people on a psychological level? Um, the political one was a little strange to kind of wrap my head around, because it's all sort of what we're going to do with these things in the future. So, um, a quote that came up that I like by uh, Kanano Simonet and uh, Shaishul was, the best time for any new policy uh, is before the technology is embedded in the culture. So you kind of don't have to be a sociology or a political major to know. It's hard to pass legislation, and once it's passed, it's hard to change. So are we comfortable with making decisions for humans decade in the future? for how their genes might be sequenced and how they might be affected evolutionarily. Because um, these things, of course, take a long time to kind of come out and, and, and affect us. The humanitarian argument came up again and again and again. And the word that kept coming up was, again was uh, eugenics, which again defined by Kanano, Simonet, and Shaishor as being well born. So this idea of creating the flaws out of humanity and they kept sort of running it parallel to how we breed uh, crops or how we breed cattle. Um, and there is a fear that with the induction of genetic engineering into mass culture, so something that's popularized and done again and again, like, um, like cosmetic surgery, is will it create these two separate sort of class sections of humanity? Those who have the money to have their genes perfected and those who don't. And this was actually explored in one of my favorite sci-fi movies, Gattaca, where there were two classes of people. And the second class of people who couldn't get their genes sequenced in such a way that they were perfect could only find menial work and manual labor. And the biological argument is something we're kind of dealing with today, in that it's hard to predict how we're going to be in the future without more testing today. And it also brings up the argument what do we consider perfection, or, or I think Corey actually touched on it, what kind of traits do we consider perfect that won't be worth having later? So, um, we're bringing up the problems of limiting uh, biological diversity, uh, inserting new information into a genome could disrupt uh, function causing uh, things and cause mutations, which again I think Corey brought up, which really excited me. And like I said, it assumes we have a clear view of what traits are bad and which aren't. So what benefits us now and what we consider to be perfect or helpful may not be what benefits us in the long run. Um, evolution takes a long time, kind of for a reason. Um, and again, there's the idea of using high-tech solutions for things that are non-problems. So do we want to introduce genetic splicing or, or a manipulation of an embryo not yet born to try and stop something as sort of simple as male pattern baldness. So, can I tell you? Uh, well, I'll, I'll be arguing in the no, there should not be limits, and there's a few reasons for this. Um, first, you can modify the immune system, not only in humans, but also in animals. So, say that we have an illness that's genetic or otherwise, we could fix that before it becomes a problem and save many lives. Um, secondly, uh, pests are a big problem, not only in humans, it's transferring disease and to our animals. 
um, but also they're a problem for crops, as in crop yields go down because pests are eating them and consuming them, and we lose all that food, and it's just waste to the pests. And then, lastly, humans will be able to fight off disease, possibly live longer, and uh, obtain favorable traits uh, more suited towards the survival of our race as a whole. Um, first, our modified immune system. Um, by using genetic manipulation, we may be able to prevent diseases like AIDS and cystic fibrosis, which many of you probably don't know what cystic fibrosis is, but it's a disease in the lungs that constantly produces more mucus than the human body, body already does, and it uh, blocks the airway, so it's, it's a constant battle for the, for the patients that have that, and uh, it's usually not non-survivable. So it's a pretty dangerous disease, that, and there's no way to stop it unless we use genetic manipulation to alter genes for the people that have it. And uh, we've actually used these uh, methods in trying to stop these diseases in animals, and right now it's only worked 50% of the time, but with more research and more, more trials and more funding from governments, possibly other private firms, we could get better testing and see if these things could actually work. I mean, think if we could stop diseases like cancer. I mean, 7.6 million people every year die from cancer. And if we could stop that, we'd be saving so, many, so much money for, for families that can't afford it, and all those lives would be saved too. Um, it's also been used to grow new arteries and heart disease patients to stop blood clots and heart attacks. Um, instead of the arteries becoming clogged by the clotting, the blood vessels grow around it as to bypass it instead of using the surgery that could be dangerous for some. Um, another thing that people may think of when genetically modifying uh, genes is uh, the human super race. And I looked at this and did some research, and right now it's unlikely. Um, that's because we don't know what genes are present that cause these favorable traits, and some examples are athletic um, intelligence, physical attractiveness, I mean, stuff that people would like to have, maybe, if they did. And uh, further research at the moment is unsafe, but uh, I'm sure we could find some stuff. And then a big one is pest control. Um, for example, mosquitoes, uh, they transform malaria, and if we could introduce a sterile population into the environment, it would kill off a lot of the mosquitoes, well, at least some, and they wouldn't be able to pass on as many offspring as they are right now, which would help in controlling the spread of that disease. I mean, this goes for also other organisms that destroy crops and things like that. And we could cut down on that, and it would be able to produce more crop yields and feed more people on this earth. Um, and then finally, the genetic engineering in animals. It's not only in humans that it would help, but we're doing this now. We genetically modify cows to produce more milk, um, and also sheep to produce more wool. And another big one that I found very interesting is uh, genetically modifying animals to produce chemicals in their blood, as well as their milk. So we can use these to make pharmaceuticals. Um, this would really help, instead of using a lab and producing these chemicals and using a lot of fossil fuels and resources, we could use naturally by using these, these uh, animals. So uh, that's all I have to say. But I actually take back my argument. I'm on his side now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for listening. <laughs>